Welcome. My name is Annie Rogers, and on behalf of the Attitude team, I'd like to thank you for joining today's ADHD Experts presentation titled Seven Insights into the ADHD Brain that Transform Lives. If you type ADHD into Amazon, more than 20,000 results will appear. Many promising tips and strategies to help you overcome ADHD-related challenges. Some of these strategies work, but what about when they don't? According to today's webinar presenter, it's precisely in those moments that we need to probe deeper and question the root causes behind our challenges. Doing so can help us get to those aha moments and glean important insights about the ADHD brain that help us move forward. Guiding us through that process today is Jeff Copper. Jeff is an ADHD coach, founder of Dig Coaching Practice, and host of Attention Talk Radio and Attention Talk Video. He coaches his clients to help them realize their potential in business and in their personal lives. Having learned to manage attention and deal with his own challenges, Jeff developed his anatomy of attention construct to help his clients control their attention and move past barriers. Jeff holds an MBA from the University of Tampa, professional designations from the International Coaching Federation and the Professional Association of AD for ADHD Coaches, and certifications from the ADD Coach Academy and the Coactive Training Institute. Jeff is a member of the Attention Deficit Disorder Association, the ADHD Coaches Organization, ADD Resources, CHAD, ICF, PAAC. Before I hand over the microphone to Jeff, I have just a few housekeeping items. Those of you tuned into the live webinar, you may download the slides now by clicking on the event resources section of your webinar screen. And if you're interested in the certificate of attendance option, just look for instructions in an email you will receive about an hour after we wrap up the live broadcast. If you are listening in replay or podcast mode, visit attitudemag.com and search podcast 389 to access the slides the webinar replay and the certificate of attendance option. If you support the work we're doing here at Attitude to strengthen the ADHD community, we encourage you to visit attitudemag.com slash subscribe and sign up for Attitude Magazine for your family or to share with a teacher or a loved one who could benefit from greater ADHD understanding. Finally, the sponsor of this webinar today is Play Attention. Enhance brain health and performance. For more than 25 years, Play Attention has been helping children and adults thrive and succeed at school, home, and work. Their NASA-inspired technology and cognitive training courses improve executive function and self-regulation. Each program includes a lifetime membership and a personal executive function coach to customize your program along the way. Click the link on your screen to schedule your free one-on-one -on -one consultation to discuss a customized executive function training course for you. Or call 800-788-6786 or visit playattention.com to learn more. Attitude thanks our sponsors for supporting our webinars. Sponsorship has no influence on speaker selection or webinar content. So without any further ado, I am so pleased to welcome Jeff Copper Thank you, Jeff, so much for joining us today and for leading this illuminating discussion. Thank you, Annie, for that kind introduction. Um, and when I'm anxious to get to the material, so let's kind of get right into it. Um, really quickly, I'm all things attention. Um, I'm very involved in the community, not just in my business, but also on the Chad marketing community. Been on the editorial advisory board of Attention Magazine for 10 years, involved with the uh, PAC, which is a certifying body, and on the professional advisory board of Totally ADD. Um, I do have some disclosures here. Uh, because of my advertising relationships with the ADD Coach Academy, uh, children and adults with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder and time timer, et cetera, just realize that I have those in my background for just disclosure purposes. Um, do with you as you want. 
So our topic today is seven insights into the ADHD brain that transform lives. And when you're trying to problem solve, um, what you have to do is you first have to be able to observe facts. Often, um, we, we don't understand things. We look at things very uh, superficially and we begin to judge, we jump to conclusions. And sometimes if you really understand how things work a little bit better on the other side, you can problem solve a lot better. One of my favorite quotes um, to illustrate this is the sun does not rotate around the earth. Again, it doesn't rotate around the earth without the right technology. It looks like it does. Or in my fun little captions here, if you're running east to see a sunset, you're attending to the wrong thing. So today I want to kind of get underneath things a little bit, talk about a little bit of ADD, which we'll cover, and then see if we can give you some insights. Where this really hits home is if you're drowned in a sea of tactics or strategies, then again, it's really illustrative as you're paying attention to the wrong thing. And hopefully we'll give you a few things to look at by the end of our, our presentation. So our objective is to articulate ADHD in a context that we can really understand. To understand it really more as an executive function impairment, not just a, a focus issue. To really understand what some of the root causes of the, of the challenge are, and then illuminate some insights around those for you to begin to problem solve a little bit more effectively. So I'll never forget 10 years ago, I'm at a conference and Dr. Russell Barkley was given a presentation. Um, at the time, he was arguing that ADHD had to be an executive function impairment. He actually had seven different arguments from different perspectives that really made a lot of sense. However, at that time, if you took an executive function test, it didn't show up as an impairment. His argument was either it's not an executive functioning or the tests are wrong. As he went in a little bit deeper, began to take a look at the definition of executive function. At the time, I think he cited there was like 34 in the literature. And I think his words were, it's like a dog's breakfast, anything goes. And so he paused for a moment and said, you know, if we're going to do anything, we need a precise definition of what executive functioning is in order for us to really be able to manage it. At the time, the, the experts kind of came together and they all agreed that self-regulation was one was huge. And so he started there. And he started to build on that concept by really identifying things in, in, in like different parts of executive function. He talks about executive function as they develop. The first is self-awareness, the mind's mirror, the ability to, to be aware of yourself. Self-restraint, the really ability to be aware of yourself and kind of control yourself. Visual imagery, the, the ability to create pictures in your mind to foresee or forecast the future. Verbal working memory, the mind's voice, that's talking to yourself in your mind towards a goal. Emotional regulation, uh, the mind's heart. Humans are one of the, really the few animals that actually can change their emotion. It's difficult to do this, it is possible. And then the last is actually playing with information in your mind, the mind's, um, mind's playground. <clears throat> he also talked about, think of the brain as a two-level system. There's the automatic brain, um, which I say is the reflexive, emotional, reward-driven brain. And then you have the executive functioning brain. That's the effortful thinking brain. It requires a lot of effort to engage your thinking brain to override the more primitive, automatic uh, brain at large. So as he described that, what I like to do is just to reorder his executive functioning tools a little bit differently so they kind of fall into those buckets. The first is self-regulation, self to me, is, is really basically self-awareness and the ability to manage your emotions, which we're going to talk a lot about, more about in a second, but the ability to kind of pause and kind of calm down, be aware of yourself and restrain yourself. The second level is the, the part of the brain that's thinking towards a goal, that's executive functioning. That's the one where you use visual imagery and self-talk and playing with information in your mind towards a goal, which um, I think Annie's game, we're gonna have a little experiment later see if we can illustrate some of that. Oh, bear with me. So at, on the objective slide, as we get into this thing, I, I really want to sometimes, I like to simplify ADHD in a context just we get lost some time in like the emotional details. And one of the things that we, we go out there is we look at motivation and we're, it's a very subjective judgment. When we look at somebody and they're not doing what we want them to do, we have a tendency to label them unmotivated. That is a observational, you know, a, a, a visual judgment. It's not necessarily rooted in fact. 
Years ago, I interviewed Roberto Olivardi, who I know has been uh, he's a big, a lot of content on Attitude Magazine because he's a bright guy. And he said, you know, Jeff, you'd be dead if you weren't motivated, which is a factual statement. And then he said something else that was has, it really wrong with me. Everything you've ever done in your entire life, you did it because that's what you were motivated to do. And everything that you haven't done in your entire life, when you could have done it, you didn't do it because you were actually motivated to do something else. Think about this. If you observe what's really going on, everything you've done in your life, you're motivated to do. I've coached people before, said, I'm unmotivated. I just sit on the couch all day and I watch Netflix. I will. You're motivated to watch Netflix. Until you acknowledge that's what you're motivated to do, really not much you can do about it because all you're doing is shaming yourself. Again, more on that later. I'd like to take a look at our consensus is, is that dopamine is the reward neurotransmitter. Now, the brain is infinitely complex, but I like to look at dopamine as the center of motivation. It's the reason that we procreate. It's the reason we forage for food. It's a very important neurotransmitter in human development because it's the reason that we, 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 we do a lot of what we do. If we begin to take a look at motivation as the pursuit of dopamine or the pursuit of pleasure, or the urge to escape pain, we can really gain a lot of insights on the ADHD brain. Because loosely, I like when I'm coaching people, let's think of ADHD as a dopamine addiction. If you get dopamine, you pay attention to it. And if you don't, you don't. The reason I like that model so much is it fits so well into Dr. Barkley's model of ADHD is an is a issue of self-regulation. You also understand that advertisers um, they've cracked the code on the human brain, and they make a business out of exploiting your desire for pleasure and your want to escape from pain. For those who haven't seen it, I would encourage you to go on to Netflix and, and watch the documentary, The Social Dilemma. It's an incredible documentary in as much as they do a great job explaining and really having tech people under, or explain to them how they are willfully designing social media games and other things to be addictive. <clears throat> They are literally programming those things to speak to your more primitive brain to get you addicted to those things. Because after all, they actually are rewarded. The more time you spend on YouTube or social media, the more eyes they have, the more advertising they have. Again, I like to simplify it in terms that we can begin to understand. So understanding that this is going on, there's two kinds of motivation in simple terms. One's organic, the stuff that we just do. Again, procreating, foraging for food, things that are pleasurable and manufactured motivation. That's giving yourself as a reward um, to do something. For people with ADHD, that, those rewards need to be frequent. And I mean very frequent. <clears throat> Understanding that is motivation. I also like to define what an emotion is. Again, this is not necessarily science. It's just my way of us understanding how the Dr. Barkley model works and actually coaching those with ADHD. To me, an emotion is a reflexive reaction to some other stimuli. You walk into the doctor's office and they hit you with that hammer, your knee reflexively kicks out. It's going to do that each time. The only way it's not going to is if you were expecting it, inhibit it. I like to think of a feeling as the physical manifestation of an emotion. So when we feel, we have a tendency to react, all right? We re react in such a way that I like to explain as, Fight, flight, or freeze is a survival mechanism. When you feel threatened with your life, you have the urge to fight back, play dead, or escape. If you listen to people out there talking about emotions in fight, flight, or freeze, it's a state that you're in when you're in that state, you actually are not thinking. The thinking brain is kind of taken offline. So if you take a look at first responders, what they do is they go practice over and over and over. Okay, don't panic. That's the pause. Let's kind of pause. Let's kind of calm down and let's get our thinking brain engaged and think about what we're doing. So when we look at emotions, I like to really emphasize it's a reflexive reaction to something. Okay. To illustrate the, it's a reaction and how when we are in an emotional state, we skip over the thinking part. There's some fun things like an overreaction is an old reaction. You might be presented in a situation that feels like something in the past, and you will conclude that that situation is the same. It might be, but it might not be. Reminds me of a situation when I was backpacking with a bunch of Boy Scouts. I looked down, oh my God, 
and I, I had this panic state, like a, a, a paralyzed. And I looked down in the shadows, what I was looking at, I'm like, wait a second, that's not a snake, a snake, that's a stick. I had a reaction because I actually got bit by a poisonous snake when I was a younger kid at one point in time. Again, that was an overreaction to the situation. I just jumped to the end. Now, our feelings are not all bad because they help us stay out of trouble. But the point really is that sometimes you have to, to, to engage the thinking brain about what's going on. I also like the word fear, forget everything and run, all right? Or facts appearing um, as real. Again, these are, these are more just things that are out there. They're, they're quotes that other people have made that really kind of speak to the point that emotion is a, is a reflexive reaction. <clears throat> so emotionally, we have an urge to seek pleasure because it feels good. And we have an urge to, to get out of pain. And at the end of the day, if somebody's hitting you over the head with a baseball bat, you're going to do something, get at it because it's painful. So <clears throat> these are core fundamental things that I think are helpful in understanding the model. As a side states, human beings actually have the ability to change emotions. It's a bit of a challenge for people with ADHD, but it's doable. So re reviewing, <clears throat> having the self-awareness of yourself and realize you have the urge to, to feel good and the emotions to, to be able to downregulate enables you to have some self-restraint. That's that piece. Now let's talk about thinking towards a goal. Thinking towards a goal requires you to use your working memory. The definition is, is the ability to hold thoughts in your mind while organizing and sequencing them without forgetting what they are. So to really illustrate this, Annie had agreed before this, she'll do an attention exercise with me. And I would like everybody to kind of participate, even though I'll be talking to Annie through this process to illustrate this, I'd like you to participate this as best you can. So Annie, you're with me? I am here. Okay, everybody, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say six words very slowly in a second. What I'm going to ask you to do is please don't write the words down. And if I say a word and you feel the urge to say that word out loud, please don't. So I'm going to give you a little bit of pause. And Annie, I'd like you to kind of pause. And after I say those six words, when you're ready, I want you to repeat them back to me out loud in alphabetical order. You ready? Ready. Igloo. Teacher, zebra, kangaroo, bumblebee, hippopotamus. Okay. Should I repeat them back? Yep. Okay. Bumblebee, hippopotamus. Igloo, zebra, I'm forgetting one. <laughs> That's okay. So everybody. Two, I forgot you... two. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. I don't want anybody to worry about how they did, but here's what I want you to observe from this experience. You didn't learn anything new. Everything that I said is something you're familiar with, and everybody knows what the alphabetical order is. But what I want you to do is you had to load those words into your mind. You had to pay attention to the words individually somehow and reorder them without forgetting them. And then say it out loud. That's what working memory is. And that's what thinking towards a goal is. You're juggling those words in alpha order. Once you say them out loud, the goal is done and you can kind of move on. I'm grateful for Annie for what she's done. I, I do this and literally more than half the time people forget the order or they forget a couple words. Annie had forgotten, let's see, kangaroo and teacher. At first she thought she'd only forgotten one, then she forgot two. Here's what I want you to take away. If you struggled with this, hopefully you can begin to see how thinking inside your head is impaired. Had you wrote the words down, it would have been easier. You would have been thinking outside of your head. If you would have actually said the words out loud as I said them and then talked out loud as you were trying to put those together, that would actually make it easier for many people with ADHD as well. Again, what I really want to emphasize is thinking towards a goal requires you to use working memory. It's an executive function impairment if you look at Dr. Russell Barclays. So it's more challenging. 
This explains why often those with ADHD need to externalizing the thinking process. So another thing that I want to highlight is when you're thinking, we think about thinking, but I like to break thinking down into pro in a process because there's different processes. One of them is methodical thinking. That's a finite number of steps where you get the right answer each time. If you're solving an algebra problem, you just, you're solving for X. It doesn't, if you understand the order of operations in algebra, you're going to get the right answer each time. It's very predictable, easy to, to, to measure and calculate. Trial and error thinking, by definition, is trial and error. If you're doing something like Sudoku or a crossword puzzle, um, those require trial and error. And by definition, right, you don't know how long it's going to take. There's a third kind of thinking that what I call is insightful thinking. It's creativity, out of the box thinking or innovation. And that's actually paying attention to something a little differently. My simple example is when I got into this business, everybody said, you need to write a book or you need to do a blog. I have dyslexia and writing is incredibly difficult for me. <clears throat> right. So I was like, hmm, I got a problem. I need to make a name for myself. But the traditional way you do that so, is not the way I did it. So it dawned on me one time if I could interview people, I could use their content. And so Attention Talk Radio and Attention Talk Video is born. In that moment, I paid attention to what I needed to accomplish differently. Insightful thinking is a trial and error process, but it sometimes required that aha, which is not something that you can always schedule. I love Dr. Ned Hallowell when he talks to you. It's not like I can schedule and have an aha tomorrow at 10 o'clock in the morning. No, they come, come about when they come about, like getting out of the shower or in the middle of the night or when you're exercising. There's another thinking process called a shift of your mindset, which I'm not going to get into. It's a little bit more complicated, but the bottom line is these are different thinking processes. When you start to get to trial and error thinking and insightful thinking, and you realize is that you're using impaired working memory and you're trying to do it towards a goal, at the end of the day, just thinking is hard. I mean, you just have to say, I've got ADHD and thinking's hard. If you don't admit it, then you're really kind of not giving the respect it's due, which we'll spend a little bit more time on. So one of the relationships that I have learned over the years between in coaching people is thinking's difficult. So we have a tendency to want to bypass thinking. I got my little aha, Bob. Here's the town of thinking, and here's the, the bypass to go around it. Our emotions off, often inhibit us from doing that. Or another one of my favorite is you got emotion sickness. There's all The only exercise you get is jumping to conclusions. All I'm really trying to illustrate there is we have a tendency to bypass thinking when we're in an emotional state. So... I didn't enlist Annie to do this because I'm going to describe this because I think most of you can simulate it. Is but one of the things that I do often is people will come to me and I'm like, okay, I really want to put you in experience. You understand what I'm doing, and I'll say, remember exponents in school, like two to the power of three, which means you have to multiply two times two is four, and then times two again is eight. So a square is just multiplying a number by itself, but I don't. I can't Exponent is you multiply that number of times. So one of the exercises I like to do when people come to me is I'll say, I'll tell you what, I'd like you to calculate three to the power of five. And often when I do that, I get the, oh my God. Okay. Then they say, well, I'm not any good at math or I can't do it. When I do that exercise with them, there's a few things that I'm trying to get people to observe. Number one is they're using working memory. Three times three is nine, times three is 27, times three is uh, 81. Wait, how many times have I multiplied times three? Having those going on your head is a bit cumbersome. But what I draw their attention to is the, oh my God, that was the emotional reaction that people have when thinking is difficult. They often want to get out. In fact, a lot of times I'll do this exercise and people won't even try. Why? Because just thinking is so difficult. Why is this important? Well, it's important that we understand what this relationship is, particularly we get into solving ADHD problems and when we start talking about the insights in a second. So we take a look at executive function as an impairment. The thing that to walk away with just some fundamentals is the ADHD brain is a reflexive, emotional, dopamine-seeking brain. It wants to feel good, and it wants to feel good right now. Okay? There's an urge to escape boredom if there's an urge to escape anything that's painful so again it wants to feel good it wants to feel good now not later or if it's it's 
If it's uncomfortable, it wants to get out of what it's doing and get comfortable. When thinking is difficult, the ADHD brain just wants to escape, as we've kind of alluded to earlier. Also, we've alluded to early thinking inside your brain is an impairment. It's easier to think outside of your brain, which is why Dr. Thomas uh, Brown's quote just it really resonates with me. As the need for independent work increases, in other words, as the need for you to think inside your brain increases, ADHD productivity decreases. <clears throat> Last year during the pandemic, when everybody was sent home to think inside their head, my phone rang off the hook. I've got motivational problems. I've got productivity problems. No, you've got a thinking problem. It's too difficult for you to think inside your head. So let's move on. Hopefully the part I think everybody kind of came here for. So what's an insight? It's a sudden comprehension that takes place when you look at something differently. We're going to talk about some of this is because we want to look at ADHD and executive function impairment. And we're start to take a look at some things that happen. We begin to understand kind of what's going on. And so maybe we get a little bit more insight of what we can do to kind of problem solve it problem solve for it. Excuse me a second. So if you're drowning to see a strategy, the strategy is there, but they're not necessarily addressing the root cause. So let's talk about some of them. First, we're talking about procrastination. One of the things I've learned in years of coaching is there's an incredible correlation between uncertainty and avoidance. If you don't really know what to do, go find something you know what to do. It sounds it's, product, it's more productive that way. Again, think about it. If you really don't know what to do, it makes all the sense in the world that you're not doing it. The other relationship is the relationship between clarity and motivation. Again, if you don't really know what to do, you go do something else. But if you know what to do, often it happens, unless it's boring, which is another factor. I have a lot of people come to me like, I mean, I got to get the motivation. I mean, you got to get the motivation. Well, if you're focusing on emotionally getting the motivation, you can write posters and stuff all over the place. But if, it's, if you don't really know what to do, it's going to have a limited impact on really what's going to happen. So as I have come to realize, about 80% of procrastination is actually rooted in ambiguity. Rooted in ambiguity. Two kinds of ambiguity. One is you just don't know what to do. Or two, you have the different pieces of it, but you can't get your, you can't get your head wrapped around it in your working memory. Okay, it comes from two different places, but at the end of the day, you end up in the same spot as you're not really clear on what to do. Another thing when it comes to procrastination, that you have to admit when something's difficult. Why? Because if you don't give it the respect that it's due, you're not going to get anywhere. You have to actually admit what's hard. <clears throat> Part of this is also to say is that if you're procrastinating, you're doing it for legitimate reasons and Understand that thinking inside of your head is effortful and that boredom is actually physically uncomfortable. You have to admit, if you have ADHD, it's physically uncomfortable. So let's just talk about what this looks like. One of the simple examples I, I had is years ago, when I'm working with somebody, I start with a two-hour discovery session. And then our first, their first homework exercise is to come back with a list of things they procrastinate on. So first call, the guy gets on the phone. I said, so, let's, you ready to go? He said, yeah. I said, what's on your list? He said, I've been procrastinating on calling my relatives to let them know about my daughter's dance recital. I said, what's hard? By the way, that's a diagnostic question. He said, nothing's hard. I said, seriously, what's hard? He goes, it's just, it's easy. It's just a phone call, Jeff. I said, come on, seriously, I, like humor me. And what's difficult? He said, Jeff, it's just a phone call. I said, stop. Here's where self-awareness comes in. Like you realize that this is the first thing you want to talk about, right? Are you aware of that? And number two, you're paying me money. You're paying me money to help you with this. So you need to admit that this is not easy. He said, all right. I said, so what's difficult? And he goes, well, now notice up to this point in time, emotionally, he was just jumping to a conclusion. It's easy. Now I got him thinking, well, I guess when I call, uh, they're going to ask me where to park, what to bring and what they're supposed to wear. And in that moment, he realizes that he doesn't have the answer to that. Now he's got to go back to his spouse. Now, you can imagine if you're out there, oh, my God, just this one thing. Can't you like the emotions are kind of kicking in that you don't really want to go through that process to go get the answers. And now you got to make the phone call. It sounds like something so simple. We just say reflexively, it's really, really easy. Well, not to the ADHD brain. It's not. You actually have to say that's difficult. In the moment you acknowledge it is you can do something different. Now, understand having the self-awareness is when his his spouse asked him to do this. If he would pause and use his visual imagery to imagine what it'd be like if he heard the question and 
he would, might ask those questions and say, give me that information. But no, in the moment, he just took it, didn't think about what he would need, didn't pause and didn't think. And so now he's there and procrastinating about making the phone call. In the moment, if you actually stop and begin to identify what's not clear or what's hard, and then begin to think, think of what's easy, you're actually getting to the root cause, often root cause of challenges with ADHD is thinking, or just you don't really know what to do. Now that you understand that, you can go problem solve for that, as opposed to just say, I'm a procrastinator, which is like calling yourself a clown. It's like just name calling. And I think it was Laura McGibbons once said, you can't, you can't treat ADHD through the lens of shame and blame. Again, the idea is first insight is to acknowledge, well, what's hard here? What's ambiguous? Where's the thinking inside my head? And, and then begin to solve for it. Ah, this is my favorite. We think of organization. Um, most people don't think of it as a two-step process. <clears throat> Anything that you have, there's multiple ways to organize it. You could organize a company centralized or decentralized. I remember when I was in a, a Boy Scout Scoutmaster, uh, we had a troop and we had patrols. You could organize the patrols, have all the boys be the same age, or you could have it vertical where you have like a 17-year-old scout, a 15-year-old scout, a 12-year-old scout, et cetera. Both systems have their pros and cons, right? Before you choose a system, you really need to think through what system works best for your circumstances. Now, this is just two options, right? But as you begin to think through the pros and cons, oh, my God, we're back to that working memory thing inside your head. Now, God love Annie. We gave her six words to repeat back, and she struggled with that. Do you see how this is difficult? Actually stopping and thinking about what are the different organizational systems and what makes the most sense for me requires you to use your working memory, or that's the way I mean, most people do it. So they skip and they just jump to an organizational system. All too often, I have people just pick an app and they jump into it. They get into it and it's a mess because they haven't stopped to think about what makes the most sense. Now, in these situations, there's a lot of, hey, sit down and talk out loud with some other people about the options, what you're trying to accomplish. Again, this is effortful for people with ADHD, but as I have learned is if you can stop and, and pause and think about what you're doing, ex actually externalize it, it's easier to organize as opposed to jump into the system and get yourself stuck. Next, illusions of convenience. <clears throat> if I had more time, I'd really like to have more time to explain this, but when you're going to sit down and you're going to, to engage in something that requires a lot of thought, maybe writing a paper or discussing a complicated concept, you actually kind of have to, I like to talk, it's like booting up your mind, like booting up a computer. You have to load all the information in your mind before you can begin to think about it. So if you boot up a computer, the operating system's got to come up, things like Skype, all the tools have to kind of come up. That's a really effortful process for people with ADHD. When they, many of them say, I'm having a hard time getting into the zone or the flow. When I'm in the flow, I'm good to go. Well, that's what we're talking about is the loading of information in your mind. It's also with regard to transition from one concept to another. So the illusion of convenience that we have in our world today is this is just an illustrative. If people were like, okay, this happened during the pandemic. I remember with a CEO, they were they sent out a complicated email to one of their direct reports and they leave and they go do some other stuff. And the guy got back, I don't know, four hours later. And so now the person with ADHD, she's got to re- load the thoughts and what she said. Then she's got to load the response from the other person and update it. Then she's got to think about what her rebuttal is to that. That's a really effortful process, having to re-engage your mind. If you're having a conversation with somebody, you don't have to re-engage. It's back and forth, back and forth. So as this would happen over a period of time, it's funny because she wanted coaching on her emails, and I'm like, well, you, you need to not have conversations via your email. You need to actually talk to them, which led to uh, a Zoom call with all the direct reports on where they would just have big, like ping the other person, have direct conversations with them. But this is one of those things that we fall into in our world is it's convenient for me to fire off that email. It's inconvenient for me to wait and schedule a meeting. But when you're having a conversation with somebody and you're going back and forth and back and forth, you're eliminating the booting up and the booting downtime, which is a working memory issue. I'll never forget, I was having a conversation with Dr. Russell Barkley in New Orleans at a conference. I was advising a kid that was needing an immediate, he had a paper and the teacher was giving feedback. And I was like, no, you need to get paragraph by paragraph feedback. And I'm like, you know, Dr. Barkley, is that a straight? Like, no, that's exactly right. Is 
from a working memory perspective, it can't be too large. It's got to be broken down. It's got to be immediate going back and forth. So a lot of times with ADHD, we fall into that trap. What is convenient is actually productive when it's the reverse. Another example of a trap I find people is, is uh, managing the world with, with cell phones. Cell phone is convenient, but there was a CEO I was coaching one time that was you know, he was, he was procrastinating on responses and stuff. And I like, you're out and about, you're sending emails with your phone. That's, it's, it's awkward. You, you don't have the tools that you need. And I said, well, why don't you get a laptop? Game changer. When he got the laptop, it was out there. And it was inconvenient for him to take the laptop, but it was a, it was a big difference. So often we fall into the illusion of convenience as being pr productive. It's also convenient to text people. I've got an organizational system I've been using since 1988. It requires folders and subfolders. I can't manage that with a text. It's, 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 it's the wrong tool. It's convenient for me to text somebody, but it's not productive. So the other illusion is being careful that sometimes you get caught into that trap. Next is the ADHD escape. Bear with me, I have to grab some notes here. As we said earlier, thinking inside your head is difficult. People with ADHD, they have this urge to escape. Whenever you heard the, the words, I feel like, you're typically not analyzing what's going on. You're grabbing some stuff from the past and jumping to conclusions. Now, sometimes you're right. Don't get me wrong. Sometimes you're right. But there's no analysis for the difference. I mean, I had an emotional issue when I was backpacking and I saw something that looked like a snake. But when I paused and took a look, it felt like a snake. Right. But when I thought about it, it's really not a snake. When you have ADHD and you notice, I feel, I feel, I feel, you realize is that that's you're some, often not really thinking about it. The other thing that's really important is people with ADHD will often say, I need to think about it. I've actually coached people on the phone, really need to think about it. Like I'm trying to engage them and having a conversation to think out loud about the topic. But their go to is I need to think about it. And I've literally said, let me ask you a question. You're saying that you need to go think about it, but in your life, have you ever actually done that? 45 year old, you're 45 years old. You're saying you need to go think about, it. tell me one or two times in your life where you said that and you actually went back and you did it. Well, I guess I've never done it. <laughs> okay, we got a little bit of self-awareness. So the idea really is just to realize is when you're saying that you pause and go, okay, that means I'm not going to do it because I have executive function, the thinking impairment. Now you're open to deal with, okay, what am I going to do about that? Either go talk out loud with somebody or find somebody help or assume that's not going to happen and move forward. I go back to me in my situation. Okay, I'm not going to write a book and I'm not going to do a blog. The moment I recognize that for what it is, I can go in another direction. Characteristics of a task. <clears throat> this is one of those things where we don't think about what's involved. Often I'll hear people say, you know, I scheduled a task to do it on Thursday at like 11 o'clock. What they do is they show up at 11 o'clock and um, they don't do it. Now, they set the goal and they made the plan, but they didn't think, well, this task requires a lot of trial and error thinking. I need to have somebody there so that when I get stuck on something, I can talk out loud. Let's talk about how this works. Remember, ambiguity is root of um, procrastination. The woman I'm coaching before the pandemic, I'm working with her and we're talking about procrastination this topic. She's arguing with me about the ambiguity issue. Then she's sent to work at home. One day I get a text, oh my God, I was at home at work and I was doing something and there was something very procedural and she could not recall the steps. Retrieving knowledge, okay, existing knowledge, is a part of working memory. She realized in, at work, she would just lean over and ask a coworker and have the answer within two seconds and be right back to what she was doing, not today. So she pinged somebody on an instant message, doesn't know if the person was at the desk or really even what was going on. Understand that when she's the right work environment, she would lean over and get somebody's attention and get right back to it. Not today. She didn't have that. She went up to go get a cup of coffee and never went back. Now, understand that she couldn't recall this information in her working memory. I'm sure, or she said, I'm sure that the answer to this is somewhere on the company intranet, but she didn't really know where to find it. It was very effortful for her to think about where she could go find it. At the end of the day, because ADHD is a thinking impairment, because she didn't, wasn't able to recall it, 
What looked like a motivation or productivity issue was really more of a thinking thing because she was in an environment that was very unproductive. Our world is putting pressure on us to go work at home, but we're getting back with Zoom calls and stuff like that because often people with ADHD, not to talk is not to think or not to collaborate. So sometimes you need to be in the right environment for that particular task in and among people. Or for me, I do a lot of stuff like this presentation. There's some creative creative stuff that I have to do sometimes. And when I'm doing it, I make sure that I have different people that know that I'm doing, I can call and reach out and have conversations with them when I hit a sticking point. Ah, this is my favorite, task Darwinism. <clears throat> Prioritization, when you prioritize something, that's the act, the act of assigning relative importance to that task. It doesn't do anything to execute that task. You're just assigning importance. What most people don't realize that to execute any task, there's a few elements that are required. Number one, you've got to be in a conducive location. If it requires you to do the task and you need a computer and you don't have one, it's not going to work. Or if it requires you to have access to multiple screens and you just got a cell phone, that's not a conducive location. Number two, you got to have sufficient time. <clears throat> if it's a task that's important, like writing a paper and it requires a lot of trial and error thinking and you don't have uninterrupted time, it's a challenge. You also have to have the right resources and the right tools, and you've got to have clarity. If you don't have clarity, you don't know really what to do. So as I talk to people, that's when task, Darwin, task Darwinism shows up. That's the natural selection of tasks based on what the based on the point of performance elements. So how does this look? You go to your computer and there's something that you need to do. Maybe you got to persuade somebody or confront somebody or convince somebody, which is it's a difficult task because you got to come up with your argument. You got to work in a way that they're going to take it. What you find yourself is doing a whole bunch of emails. What you might notice is you're migrating to the emails that you know what to do. You, you're in a conducive location. You have everything you need and you have clarity. What you end up doing is beating yourself up. I should be doing this important thing, but you're not. You're doing these other things. Again, we go back to you haven't solved for that clarity problem. And you're tempted by these other things. Understanding that that's what's going on is better than just saying I'm procrastinating or I'm lazy but to recognize is you got to have those elements together and people don't necessarily think about that. They're often coming together. They got pieces of it. And they don't necessarily do it. Remember earlier I said you procrastinate for a legitimate reason. Well, you do because it's unproductive to sit there and spin your wheels. If you don't really know what you do, you might as well get something done so you can take the pressure off to do something else. Ah, this is another one of my favorite. <clears throat> Remember the ADAC brain? It's a reflexive emotional brain. It wants to feel good now, not later. And it doesn't want to feel uncomfortable. A lot of, a lot of people talk about sleep hygiene. Uh, there's all kinds of stuff out there, which is, you know, it's noble. It requires self-regulation. But when I'm coaching people with ADHD, I'm like, the facts are this. If you put your head on the pillow, it's supposed to take 15 minutes between the time you put your head on the pillow and the time you actually fall asleep. That's incredibly uncomfortable for people with ADHD and they resist it. They'll do anything not to get in bed. They're occupying their, their mind with something else. Often I'll have people call me in, you know, I'm, I'm exhausted. I'm not getting out of bed. I'm like, okay, so what's your brain doing to entertain itself at night? Oh, I get all kinds of stuff. Like I was on YouTube or Facebook or social media or, you know, whatever it is. And so the, if, you, if you begin to think about this, many, by the way, many people with ADHD that do go to sleep early, they exercise a lot or they're just passing out out of exhaustion. So if you understand that you have an emotionally reward-seeking brain and going to bed is a boring act, the idea really is, is not to just go to sleep hygiene, and it's not just to shut yourself off of all social media because your brain wants to entertain itself. The trick is to watch your behavior because you want to find something that will capture your attention enough to engage it, but not too much where the brain won't surrender itself to sleep. Kind of like a post-it note. Sticky enough to put on the wall, but not too sticky to take the paint off. What does that require? Well, self-observation, because it depends on who you are. But I will share with you, I've had some adults, some success with adult coloring books. You get in bed at night, you have the coloring, you have the movement, the creativity, kind of the mindlessness where it captures their activity. And then finally, their brain surrenders itself to sleep. 
I've had other people before where they turn all lights off now, so they've got one of those minor lights on top of their head, and they're cleaning. It's the physical movement and the getting things done in a quiet environment. Uh, that helps. I've had people before where they, there was a podcast that they really like, and you go, wait a second, that's stimulating. I go, yeah, but they've listened to it so many times, they're familiar with it. And one guy, as he said, I turned the volume so I could just barely hear it, so I actually had to strain to listen to it. The point really here is you're intentionally engaging your brain in something that's not too stimulating, but not too boring, all right, in a period of time to enable your brain to surrender itself to sleep. Again, I've heard a lot of people talk about stuff. I got some, and I have an ADHD brain. Yes, it's leaping out of bed and it's jumping to anything that will entertain it. So again, you pass out of exhaustion. How do you manage that? You got to have some self-awareness and you got to design the environment in the right way for that to happen. So my bonus insight is this. Jeff, you say that procrastination, most a lot of times, is rooted in ambiguity. Absolutely. Jeff, if you chunk it down, isn't that a way to remove the ambiguity? Yes. But you're saying it doesn't work, which I do say. Exactly. Well, Jeff, you're confusing me. If it's ambiguous and chunking it down is a way to remove the ambiguity, what gives? Well, what gives is everybody takes that and they go back and they do it inside their head, expecting that to work. It's difficult. You know, Annie was grateful to be a participant. I gave her six words. She forgot two of them. That's why things like that don't work. So you can have a lot of tips, tricks, and strategies about some of that stuff. But the root cause often, as I'm finding more and more of stuff, is a thinking impairment. If you don't make the thinking easier, you have a an emotional reaction to escape. It looks like a, a, a focus issue, and it is, but the root cause is the thinking part. So we've talked about organizational systems, you know, the trial and error process of thinking about what's going on, the thinking about really what's ambiguous and how am I going to get around it, chunking it down. Do you see a common theme here? A lot of these things, it comes down to thinking, and a lot of times we're not addressing the thinking issue. Where the things that work, you'll notice, is often they help, they make thinking easier. The point really here is, is ADHD is an executive function impairment, as we described. If you understand what's going on with what I've described, you can begin to identify the root causes and actually maybe problem solve to do something about it as opposed to just emotionally escaping. So I'd like to thank everybody that's still with us to, for the, taking the time to listen to the presentation. I hope that you've gained some insights. As my mom has said, if I go to a conference and I can walk away with one or two ahas or takeaways, it's worthwhile. So I'm hoping that maybe some people have gotten one or two of those. And so with that, we'll open it up to questions. Great. Thank you so much, Jeff. That was, gave us a lot to think about. Um, and before I lead into questions, I want to just give a quick thank you again to our sponsor, Play Attention, uh, sponsor of this webinar. And then I wanted to repeat a quote that you said, actually, um, you can't teach ADHD through the lens of shame and blame. I believe that was a, a quote of someone. I didn't get the name. It, but it was, I, uh, Laura, I, I, if I recall, it's Laura McNivens. I think she's out of Toronto. I can't remember if she's a psychologist or a therapist, um, but she'd written an article one time for Attention Magazine. I was in the middle of it. And when she, I read that, I was like, oh my God, that, oh, it just resonates. So I'm saying it, but remember Laura McNivens is the one who that originated from. Okay. Well, to me, it really rang true that, that today is all about understanding how your ADHD brain works. It's, it's not that it's deficient, it's different. And coming to terms with that is, is step number one, which leads to what I thought was a really powerful question here from um, one of our listeners who said they were diagnosed at age 63. And they're tr having a hard time, um, quoting, dealing with all the negative associations they grew up with, that they were a difficult child, quote unquote, oversensitive. Um, and wondering if you have advice for strategies to move beyond some of that shame and blame. So, oh my God, there's so much cool stuff. First of all, understand is that you were, if you were diagnosed later in life, it could have been missed or you could have been high functioning. Uh, a lot of the world, I think, is getting diagnosed now because, like, back in the 80s and 90s, the world was different. Some people are gravitating to technology, but other businesses are changing, so they're very successful, maybe collaborating with people, and now they're working in isolation, and so you're struggling more, so you get diagnosed. So sometimes diagnoses are coming because the world are changing. That's number one. Number two, this is a real challenge because it's your emotional reaction uh, that's kind of coming into play. 
And this is where meditation and mindfulness kind of come in, where you sit there and you begin to pause, you take a couple deep breaths and you downregulate, you begin to realize, hey, that's an emotion. And, you know, there's nothing I can do about that now. I can forgive that self. I've made it this far. I need to focus in on what I can do tomorrow. As they say, <clears throat> rehearsing the past doesn't change anything about the future, but you can begin to focus on what you can do to change tomorrow. Um, sometimes a coaching can help with that. A therapist can help with that. But a lot of times if you're just rehearsing the past over and over and over emotionally, you're actually digging yourself into a deeper hole. And I encourage you to kind of let that go. Not an easy thing to do. Um, but if you just kind of pause and begin to think, no, two resources I think about. It. I did an interview with Autumn Zatani in 2014 from Sesame Street about what they were doing with the Muppets to help kids self-regulate. Um, Attitude Magazine turned that into a blog. Um, you can go check that stuff out and talk about, you know, how the process of, of, of switching emotions and managing that. So going back to the question is, one, you might have made it a real long time because you're in the right environment. It's changed. Number two, you know, kind of pause, take a step back, downregulate your emotions and realize I can't change the past. Rehearsing it doesn't help, but focus on what went right to change tomorrow um, and look for the evidence. And that can be helpful. And you get help doing that if you need it. <laughs> um, I, I want to read this quote as well from another listener who said, um, so much of this rings true over the years, I became less tolerable of frustration. I find it horribly painful and I avoid it by abandoning my work and seeking distraction and pleasure in the t in TV or the internet, which really speaks to what you were saying about that escape, uh, escape thinking. And a few people were asking, does uh, escaping also look like daydreaming or zoning out, um, especially during boring yeah. meetings? Yeah. So, so this is another little aha. People say, Hey, in fact, I just have a YouTube video I posted recently is, is when you're taking a break, is it an escape or is it a break? If you're doing something that's very methodical, yeah, taking a break is really pretty good. If you're doing a, like a thousand, you know, a hundred word, or 100 step algebra problem and you get to 50 you can take a break and you come back and you can pick up where you left off that's that's a good break if you're doing something that requires trial and error and an aha and you leave and you're not coming back you'll notice is that when you're doing trial and error and you haven't had the aha you gotta gotta go back to the beginning you gotta reboot number one it's hard and then it's it's the thinking's hard you haven't solved the problem when you leave you gotta come back and reboot those times often you're actually escaping the thinking part, 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 and that's not really taking a break. Having that awareness is really, really important. And um, hang on a second, I forgot part of that question. Um, can you read that again, Annie? My working memory evaporated. <laughs> I, I understand. Um, <laughs> they were asking about um, whether, yeah, uh, zoning out or daydreaming. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, daydreaming can be very much a, hey, I'm in this and I start to think about some other things. Um, day, daydreaming or playing, that, think about it. You can daydream, but you're not directed towards a goal. The difference between daydreaming and thinking towards a goal is you're trying to accomplish something. People with AD, ADD love to daydream and just kind of float on a breeze. What makes it difficult is to get them sequenced to an outcome. And so, yeah, it can be difficult uh, to stay on task and you'll escape daydreaming. And again, that's where thinking outside your head and collaborating can help. On that point, um, a question from a few people who are introverts. And for them, uh, interaction has its own, you know, um, problems yep. or, or uncomfortable, yeah, aspects. Um, any advice for them? They see the benefit of, of externalizing information, but doing so in a very social way is also extremely uncomfortable. So I think some people equate introvert as being social. It's not. It's just having access to people that you can talk out loud to or to interact with. Um, you know, one of the things I, I, I find that's challenging – I spend a lot of time kind of convinced college students that you, you, I don't know why you're sitting in your dorm room trying to think, why don't you go to the professor's office, which is interesting to me because they're like, well, I'm like, have you ever stopped to think like a teacher's job is actually to make learning easy? I mean, that's why they have office hours. And I've actually had some like, well, I don't like to be in groups. Like you don't have to be, you can be an introvert, just go into their office and ask them questions. Right. Which is interesting because this is another aha 
a lot of people don't realize is, is that when you're going to the office, they're intimidated because they don't have the questions. And I'm like, well, it's because you don't have the education. You need to go to the professor and say, I, I'm having a hard time getting my head around this. I need to get an education over this. If I, if I knew what it was, I could ask you questions, but I don't. And so circling back around is being hanging out with the people and having a conversation with somebody in a social setting, that's one thing, but actually goal directed where you're going to somebody and say, I just need to think out loud or I need to think through this, or can you help me? That's not really being an introvert. That's actually just having people that you go to as a tool to work through it. Does that make sense? It does. It does. And it's a, here's a related question that I thought was really important. How can we advise teachers who aren't trained in understanding ADHD to better help high school students who are mislabeled as unmotivated or bad students? So this is what this is all about is, you know, at the end of the day, people's experience is through their own filter. In other words, you know, Annie, only Annie can see what she's paying attention to inside her head and she can't see what's going on in my head. And so when you go out into the world, believe it or not, people are not looking for what they got wrong. They're looking for evidence that they're right. If you ask, if I ask Annie, hey, Annie, give me that green jacket, that green cup and that green folder. And I got what I wanted every time I'd be convinced that those objects are green. The fact of the matter is they're not. They reflect green light. My point really is, is everybody sees the world for their filter. And when it comes to teachers and stuff, the idea is to get information and collectively society kind of help educate them. I know in the last 15 years, uh, I take a look at the ADC landscape, what Attitude Magazine's done, what Attention Talk Radio's done, and a whole bunch of other people. We've educated more and more. People are coming around. Um, but it's going to take time because there's this resistance for people's just their, their own bias. And, and here's another aha I'm going to leave you guys with is I, I say this when I'm coaching people and I help them understand what works for them. You have to remember that it's convenient for society if you do it their way. I will repeat that. It's convenient for society if you do it their way. I know I can get my bank statements online. I get them by the mail on purpose. It's easier for a manage. It's less taxing to my working memory. But the banks are bullying me every single day because it's easier for them to do it their way. I have to understand what works for me and I have to advocate for myself. Um, that's just a reality of the world. I don't like it but it's there and the more people begin to understand that and focus on what works for them and then revealing the mystery and then advocating for itself the better. So we can't solve that problem in totality other than we're getting better with collective awareness, but also it also goes back to you understanding what works. For you. Right. And I think we all saw that keeping things in my brain does not work for me. Thinking inside my brain, my, yep. I externalize information by writing absolutely everything down. Um, and a number of people had questions about, um, do you recommend externalizing information in planners and other um, so, so, written so forms? I, I, Lord, yes. However, you, you got, you, I know we're running out of time, but I've learned over the years, everything you do instinctively, like you have coping mechanisms. If you just let go of what the world's telling you to do, the answers to all Everything that works are hidden in plain sight. The issue, the reason you can't see them is they're hidden behind expectations and misconceptions and assumptions. People with ADHD, a lot of them talk out loud instinctively because they're, they talk a lot. They're talking out loud because it's more productive. They're not aware of it. So if you're going to externalize stuff, you, you take a look at, you know, areas in your life where things work. If you, if I tell somebody they need to journal, and then it's too hard, too tedious. Some people can journal, they write out loud. Other people need to talk about it. Other people need just to like talk in cell phones. How you externalize, it really depends on what comes natural. That's where you have to learn to observe yourself. I mean, I've, to, to, to force something on you that requires too much is not going to work. So I, as I tell people, water flows downhill because it's the path of least resistance. Externalize and look at your behavior and witness how you externalize stuff in the easiest way. And then jump onto that and try to tweak it because you've got a higher probability of, of being successful with that than adopting some tip trick or strategy that's just not going to work for you. Right. And that goes back to one of your first points about trial and error. 
Um, I certainly tried hundreds of, well, not hundreds, dozens of apps before I decided that a paper planner was just what my brain needed. Well, and but, 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 yeah, understand. I did an interview with Dr. Russell Barkley on Attention Talk Radio. It's just Attention Talk Radio GPS. And we talked through his theory. I talked about what I'm doing. At the end of it, we're like, yeah, yeah, we concluded that paper is high tech for people with ADHD. Because you can spread it all out. You can see it all at one time. Now, for some, it's overwhelming. But if your urge is to print it, you got to follow that urge and not try to put it in a binder, which is a whole other thing. Multiple screens is a working memory nightmare for people with ADHD. That's a whole other webinar sometime. But the point really is, is you got to be self-aware and own what works for you and gravitate that direction. If you're trying something somebody tells you and it's just not working, acknowledge it's hard and, and let it go and, and, and find something else. But look at what comes naturally to you. And that is a great uh, point to end on here today. We are out of time, but I want to um, thank you, Jeff, and thank you everyone for joining us today and contributing your voice and your questions to our ADHD community. Um, we hope that next week you will join us for another free webinar. We will be discussing um, raising socially smart tweens and teens with ADHD. Um, that's with Ryan Wexelblatt. I know there were a lot of questions today about this topic. Um, so I hope you'll join us for more tips and tricks for tweens and teens. And to make sure that you don't miss any future Attitude webinars, uh, please visit attitudemag.com slash newsletters, and you can sign up to receive our webinar alert emails. So for today, Jeff, thank you so much again for this presentation, and thanks everyone thank for joining us. We hope to see you all again soon.